morning, good afternoon. This is called Knowing Your Place in This Universe is Crucial. <clears throat> There's a reason knowing your place in this universe. There's a reason why knowing this is crucial. And the only way to know your place in this universe is to remember who you are again. Awaken to the inevitable nature of your being. And when you know your place in this universe, you no longer have the questions of what to do here, what should you do here. You no longer feel lost. You no longer feel confused. You no longer need or seek any guidance, for everything is already taken care of by you. And what this does when you know your place here is it brings you new seeing, clear seeing. It allows you to see animals, people, things. It allows you to see them for what they are and see through them. That's what having two or three eyes, two to look and one to see truly means. Because you're not truly looking with the two outer eyes, but the inner eye. So when we know who we are, we know who and what everything else around us is. We know that even when we're alone, we're never by ourselves. Because we are existence in itself. And life is everywhere. There is no place or no thing that is not alive or life, existence. Therefore, who you are permeates into everything. Solid, liquid, and gas. The air, the trees, the ground, your feet. The above, the below, the inside, the outside. But when we don't know who we are, we run about day after day in a great panic, in a great hurry, feeling as if very anxious, as if we must do something or we must achieve something here or we must perform miracles here. And all that needs to be done is knowing who we are. Because once we know who we are, it's very easy to know your place in this universe. And never again will you need guidance or anyone or anything to tell you. Never will you need government conspiracies for any conspiracy for that matter. You don't need an alternative story. There's always two sides to the story, we know this, because there's two sides of your brain, and we're all split right down the middle. And that is the law of duality, which serves nothing but the ego, keeps nothing alive but the ego. Duality is what allows us to keep the dream alive, keep the dream going, that we are separate, that we are in some physical world. But we've never been in a world. We've only been in a world of our own. Right within the mind. <clears throat> we look at everything that we see and experience through this human lens, therefore we don't understand it. We don't understand animals, we don't understand ourselves even, because we're looking at it through a human lens, through a human focal point, through a very limited focal point. But when you begin to expand your lens, expand your awareness, and expand your horizons, your, your sights, on who you are, you will reach the inevitable conclusion that you are everywhere, everything. And what that means is you are the one responsible for everything. That means you've created animals, you've created man, 
You've created the objects we experience. And this is how you understand what you're seeing and experiencing. Don't look at them from a human looking at an animal. Don't look at them from an uh, an outsider looking in, meaning you don't understand what it is. You do understand exactly what it is because you've created it. You designed it. If anyone knows what you are experiencing or what is around you, it is you because it was you the whole time. You are beyond the birthing and the death of what you think to be yourself. And what you truly are is the one responsible for all of these things. You committed the final doing. And what that final doing was, was existence. That's what the human is driving themselves crazy trying to figure out, is what are we supposed to be doing here? What the hell is going on? But that's what we must realize, is we're never satisfied with our doings. If we discover a planet just like Earth, this could be the greatest discovery to mankind, right? This will satisfy us as humans momentarily for a week, a month, six months, a year. But eventually you will persist again and be unsatisfied with what you've just found. Because we're constantly identifying with the doings and what we're finding in these doings. But all we're truly searching for, because we're never satisfied with our doing, all we're truly searching for is that final aha moment where everything connects and makes sense in an immediate moment. And the only way that is to happen is for you to realize who you are here and now. While time is still on your side, get to the bottom of who you are within yourself. When you say, I know, I have a question, I am afraid, I am excited, that I thought that you speak through is what you inquire into. That I thought when you speak and say, I, that is as deep as you know yourself. And that is how you self-inquire into who you are through introspection and keeping your focus on who am I. The mind will constantly wander. The mind will constantly create other topics or other scenarios, other things to focus on. But what you must focus on if you want to truly awaken is who am I? And in turn, when you know who you are, you will have restored your place here on this universe or in this universe. You will, in an immediate moment, know exactly who you are and what you're supposed to be doing here. And you will realize that the mission of what you're trying to do has already been done by you. And that's why I call it the final doing. You are what you're calling God, which means you are responsible for the greatest thing known to mankind, and that is existence in itself. And the reason it's so great is because we have no explanation for why we exist. We don't know how we exist. We don't know why we exist. But we will sit here and let scientists and other people with all this logic and fact tell us, who we are, why we are, and explain these things when they truly don't resonate, at least not for me. I was never satisfied with science or religion. In fact, religion telling me that I would die and go somewhere forever, whether it be heaven or hell, drove my mind insane. And it never resonated with me. I don't care how magical and wonderful you make heaven sound. If I am there forever, I am stuck and now bound by this place. It's never resonated. Therefore, I searched beyond. I searched and challenged my beliefs. I inquired deeper into who I am. Those who are serious are done with playing the blame game. We're done with pointing the fingers. It's your fault. It's the government's fault. It's their fault. We're done with playing the blame game. If you want to awaken, self-inquiry is imminent. It must happen. It is inevitable. 
And that's, that's what it means when you tell someone you've had the power all along. At any moment when you decide, you can awaken and unlock the greatest answer in the universe. When you've seeked enough, when you've suffered enough, or when you've simply persisted enough on the quest of who you are, you will inevitably inevitably be led back into yourself. But it comes at a price. And that price is what you're calling death. You must experience the ego death, the death of who you assume yourself to be, in order to properly be introduced to yourself truly for the first time. Because when we're trying to meet God, we're trying to meet God from the position of Tyler. Tyler wants to step forward and we want to meet God as this camera lens is something looking back at me. But the price that must be paid when we die is the fact that when you step up and you're ready to meet God, you're not having some entity or some grand wizard or some grand being or entity stand before you and look back at you. It's almost like a, either a replica of yourself or a mirror simply moves up and it's you looking at yourself. That's the price that must be paid. Are you sure you want to know God? Are you sure you want to be God? Because it does come at a price. Everyone talking about, you know, connecting to the third eye or realigning the chakra or being in the crown chakra or the highest state. What you're essentially saying is that you, you can become God or you can do something to reach that highest state of, of being God, of experiencing God. But this is nothing but a commercialized belief. Something that we can sell to other people. And this is why I'm glad I have a job. I don't want to rely on my message and donations and asking people for money for my, my truth or my, my words. I don't want to rely on this, you know, this payment, this form of exchange for me to eat and survive. That's, that's why I'm happy. I'm happy to work a job. I don't want to ask people for money because spirituality has already been dulled down enough and commercialized. It's been infiltrated already. So there has to be someone out there that's going to offer the unfiltered, unbiased, and free truth. Because the ultimate totality of truth cannot be charged to you. The only price you will be paying is the price within yourself. That is the only price you will ever pay for truth or awakening in spirituality. A guru's job is not to charge you and especially not to have you come back. A guru's job is to strip all the ideas you have of yourself because these ideas you have of yourself are what's making you separate from me and is what's making you and me different. It's what's making you see me as guru and you as student. But when you know who you are, the teacher leaves because no longer do you see teacher and student, you see yourself on an equal playing field. And that's why the Buddha taught total death. The Buddha taught total death because he did not want people returning to him. When the Buddha became commercialized, <clears throat> once the Buddha became commercialized, now you need to return because we need your money. This is commercialized Buddha. This is not Buddha. This is not Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. This is not Buddha. Nor is Jesus or these entities you've created for yourselves the, the ultimate answer or truth. They were conveyors of the truth. They were displays of the truth. They were messengers of the truth. But understand that these men, these people were you. When you know who you are, you don't need these idols. You don't need reflections. You don't need guidance. And it's not to sound ego-filled saying you know it all, but you know who you are. And what that does is it brings about a clarity of who, what you should be doing here. 
but we don't know who we are, so we go about our days, day after day, acting as if we must perform some miracle or do something crazy beyond ourselves or, or discover something crazy beyond ourselves. And the answer is so simple. Just live and exist. You are God. And what yourself as God is saying to you is just show up. I provide everything for you because I love you and I am you. All you must do as the egoic body and mind that you think you are is show up. God has already, or what you're calling God, you <clears throat> have already taken care of the next and the beyond. Therefore, by you being in touch with the unknown, you are in the crown chakra, the highest state. No effort required. No practice required. No mantra required. <clears throat> no reminder required. This is why Buddha changed and revolutionized what we call meditation. Because again, this is Buddha and this is how you meditate. I asked a young man at my job the other day because he told me his girlfriend was really spiritual and she got him into meditating. And I said, listen, that's beautiful. That's, that's good if it helps your mind, if it helps calm you. However, what do you feel you are producing or getting out of the meditation? Are you, are you just doing it for clarity, for peace of mind, to, you know, to, to decompress from your day? Or are you doing it for a spiritual purpose as in if I meditate, now I'm in the highest state with God. Now I can do or achieve something which was impossible prior. Because if you're just decompressing, if you're just sitting in silence, if you're just being, that's totally fine. No problem. But what happens is the ego becomes, <clears throat> it begins to attach with these doings, these practices. And the whole point of spirituality is to experience what's called an ego death. To cease to the self beyond the ego, beyond life and death. <clears throat> so meditation cannot begin or end. And this is why Buddha said, if meditation is something that you're only doing once in the morning and once at night, then it, it, you're, you're basically missing the entire point. Meditation is not something that you enter into and then exit out of. Meditation is bridging you and grounding you with your truest self, with your truest presence. And the moment you come out of meditation, you are back into the ego. You have forgotten who you actually were. So just because you say, I am always in meditation, whether I'm walking, sitting, sleeping, eating, running, working out, that does not imply that I'm doing this. Because when I used to tell people in my videos, I never leave meditation. I'm always in meditation. They say, are you kidding me? You sit on a corner or you sit on a rock all day and do nothing? Because this is what meditation has been taught. This is what meditation is to us. It's a doing. It's an act. And you know what these acts serve? They serve the ego. And the results produced serve the ego. But many of us who are honest with ourselves eventually start to realize that we're not actually bringing about any real results. We're not actually producing an honest result. We can fool the entire world and make them believe we are. But if you within yourself want the real thing, then fooling the world is pointless. We want the real thing. We want the real result. Which means we must leave behind all these groups, the trending topics, the spiritual practices, the spiritual discussions, all these things. 
These, these, these people are not going to help you. They're going to charge you for what you already have. They're going to create imbalances where there aren't any. So what these practices essentially do is reinforce the very ego you are seeking to be rid of. And that's why we call the the we call an an awakening a game. It's kind of a game because some people flirt with the idea of awakening by going back and forth between mm, I want to awaken, I want to entertain the idea that I could be something else and other people like myself were face planted to the TV screen stuck and focused on who am I? That was it. I don't care about any news story. I don't care about if Capricorn is in this house or if Mars in, is in the Aquarius zone and then Cancer is in this area. I didn't care about any of that. The only thing I cared about, the only thing that I was focused on day, night, eat, sleep at my job, all day, all night. The only thing I could focus on was who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Day in and day out, day after day. I ate, breathed, and sleep. Who am I? There was never a minute where my focus was somewhere else. Who am I? Forget about what's going on in the government. Forget about what we think is going on for a minute. Let's turn all this chattering noise and camera lens in on itself. The voice in my head is speaking as myself. And this focal point within me is what's projecting the entirety. So let me self-inquire and confront myself in this immediate moment. Let me question the voice in my head. And let me turn this lens, instead of it always being outward, turn it in on itself. And what, how you do that is you, you talk to yourself and you say. You literally turn your camera lens on itself, just like I'm doing here. And you say, basically, you've had many questions You've answered many questions, and it seems the more you answer these questions, the more questions come about. So at what point do we ever get somewhere, or do we just keep getting tangled in the knots? And that's the thing. We must realize that inevitably and eventually we're not getting anywhere with anything we're doing, practicing, or seeking. Because you already have the answer, and it's so close to you, it's not even far away from you. It's so close to you that you are missing it. That you're looking for it in every other place but where it's at. And that's why these spiritual practices truly get in our way. They hurt us. <clears throat> and what I mean is they hurt our growth. They stunt our growth. Because we're saying we want the result. We want to awaken. But little do we realize that our belief in this doing and this practice, although it has good intention, it is reinforcing and keeping you from experiencing that very divinity you are trying to achieve. And the reason you're not achieving it is because it has been achieved already. All you must do is stop and embrace yourself in this moment. But we cannot do that. We're always saying we can figure it out. We can do it better. We can correct it. We can connect to it. But what are you connecting to? There is nothing out there. And again, if you want to persist and believe in this, then I encourage you, go chase it. That's what NASA has been doing forever, chasing their own tail into an oblivion until you devour yourself because you're not getting anywhere. Look at the rockets they've sent up in space. They and eventually they hit a wall. They hit the wall in space because that wall in space is the confines of your head. The above is the below, the below is the above. 
Everything you are seeing up here and around you is already inside of you, inverted. And that's why I say we're not human. We are something so much more than we're able to comprehend, especially when we are trying to identify as a human being. When we're trying to identify as a human, we will never understand or comprehend our, our chaotic nature. Because chaos is the complete opposite of what a human being is. A human would never know chaos because the only thing supporting the human dream is order, time, space. This is what supports our dream of us being separate. But all of these constructs are not laws in the universe. They're mental. That's why time is an illusion. It takes place in the mind. A hundred years ago was the same moment, same presence at, that is alive now. But we're identifying with the mirror, with the objects appearing in the mirror. So that's why we're saying, I have died. Where will I go as this when I die? You will be here. The answer is obvious. It's been with you the whole time. But we don't want to look at it. We prolong it. We distract ourselves and continue to further serve the voice which we know will one day cease to exist. And this is why death is a tragedy for the majority of people. Because we cling on, we fight to hold on till the very last second, till we physically can't anymore. But had you taken this time, this now moment, this mirror, to look into it and see yourself, death would never be a tragedy. It would be just like putting your head on that pillow at night and knowing you're waking up in the morning. You don't think. It's not a thought. When you know, you know. <laughs> That's why you can only die one time. You have to actually believe in death and believe that you can die so that you can experience what you're calling death. And when you experience what you're calling death, it becomes very clear to you that what you thought began as yourself never was. Which means what will end as what you're thinking yourself is never will. Because chaos is your truest nature. You do not exist between point A and point B. Beginning and end. But every human story has what? The laws of duality, the laws of order. But remember, these are not laws. They're only made into laws by the ego. We tell ourselves these are laws which can't be broken, but they very well can be broken because you are not human. Therefore, the entity you're calling human that has created these things doesn't exist, nor do its constructs. Space-time is simply the shadow to your ego. You remove the ego, space-time dissolve with it. <laughs> there is nowhere to go. But that's the great question. Why do you need to go? Go somewhere. Where are you actually going? You can only go somewhere when you assume yourself to be just one body in one position of space. But when you begin to identify with what you're calling God, this immortal presence, which is everywhere, permeates everything. You're not reduced to one person, to one place, to one thing. When you know who you are and you have experienced God, you are in that immediate moment at every place, at every person, at every time that has ever been and ever will be. And that's why in Alice in Wonderland, Alice says, how long is forever? The white rabbit, sometimes just one second. Because when you know, you know. To experience infinity only takes one second. To die only takes but once. Because death requires your belief in death, the end. 
And since you believe in who you are as the beginning, then you, you will logically so believe in the ending. But the only way you can see into the beyond, beyond that ending, is for you to experience it. And what that means is for you to actually think you are dying, to mourn yourself. How many people can say they are willing and ready to mourn the loss of themselves? This is spirituality, and it's free of charge. It requires no material or no money. It requires the heavy toll and the heavy price of your ego, though. Very heavy price. In fact, I think most people would rather pay any sum total of money versus their egos. It's the very same reason why we fight to hold on in a hospital bed till the very last second. The very same reason. Because we want to pretend and get lost in the dream just a little bit longer. And understand this, because some people say, well, what's wrong with dreaming and getting lost in it? Nothing at all. But I don't speak for people who are comfortable in their dreams, who are happy in their dreams. I speak to people who are suffering immensely as I was, and people who were seeking something beyond themselves that you know within your heart but just could not put words to. This is who I speak for. The you that knows something beyond yourself, and you know it's greater than what you know to be yourself. But the only twist is you don't realize that that is yourself. So back to the question, where will you go when you die? Why must we go anywhere? Because when we fully have realized and experienced this moment again, you have touched forever. You have touched infinity. You have touched every incarnation at every place and every time. If you ask me, there is no such thing as a spiritual practice. None. And there's a fundamental reason you can pull, pull up all my videos that I've ever made. I have never given anyone instructions or practices on spirituality. Because spirituality is not a practice. And it's not a form of doing. But a, 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 a point of self-inquiry. Of looking within. Welcome, Christine. I'm glad to see you on here. But I get so frustrated sometimes because obviously I just want to see all of us in what we're calling that highest state, that God state. And it gets me so excited and I have so much passion behind it that I want to share this with people. I want other people to be able to experience this. And if anyone knows the frustration and the, the helplessness you feel when you are soul searching and to trying to discover who you are, it's me. Because I've survived suicide. I've survived these things. I was to the point of, of giving up. And I did. I woke up in the hospital. I woke up in the psych unit. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. But I was ready to let go. I was ready to quit. But everything is already as it should be. Everything already was. Meaning if I was supposed to die in that hospital bed, that's what it would be. But I have already written this. It already is. And when I look back at my life now, it couldn't have happened any more perfect. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It could not have happened any more perfect in the order in which everything was. But we're being taught that spirituality is just going to produce blissfulness and peace and love and 
We're skipping up the, the shadow self. We're skipping the shadow work. We're skipping the self-inquiry. We're skipping the hard part and just getting to the, to the fruits. And in order to produce those fruits, you have to plant the seed. And you have to water that seed. And you have to pay attention to the above as the below and the below as the above. Because they are connected as one. There's a reason none of us know what's going on here. And the thing is, is none of us can know what's going on. But if someone does tell you they know what's going on here, they're lying to you. Because there is nothing going on here but an expression of existence dancing throughout itself. We are the universe experiencing itself. But we think we're a human experiencing ourselves through the universe. Or we say, you know, we're the universe experiencing ourselves, but we're still a human. Or we're a soul beyond the human, but we're still a human in this incarnation or in this veil. And we fail to realize. But this is, this is where self-inquiry serves its purpose. If you call yourself human and you swear to yourself as a human, you, this is what you think you are undoubtedly, then this is your point of, of self-inquiry. What does a human look like? Where did a human come from? How do I know this is a human? Because I birthed out my mother's womb. I saw other objects that looked just like this. But I heard other people call this human. This is human skin. This is a human hand. But what made this human? Other than me hearing it and then speaking it out further. A human. Human hand. Because, you know, in the Gospel of Thomas, the chapter that was taken out of the Bible <clears throat> is called, uh, it's Logan 22, the Gospel of Thomas. And the passage is called, When the Two Become One. And it's a chapter very crucial because one of Jesus' disciples asked him, how did you attain the sovereignty of God? How did you become God, essentially? How did you reach this knowledge? And he talks about, when you make the above into the below and the below into the above, and when you make a human hand into God's hand and a human eye and or eyes into God's eye, a human eyes into God's eye. And when you make the masculine into the feminine and the feminine into the masculine so that the masculine is not merely man and the feminine isn't merely woman, then you will have attained the sovereignty. And it's very fundamental, that, that passage, when the two become one, because he's directly telling his disciples how he got his knowledge of God. He's giving you the answer, and that's why it was taken out of the Bible. That's why, and again, I forget the passage that says this, but it says, I think it's Matthew, the book of Matthew, but this is why I speak to them in parables. Though they have eyes for seeing, they do not see. Though they have ears for hearing, they do not hear. This is why the Bible's in metaphors. The common person, though they have eyes, they're not ready to see. Though they have ears, they're not ready to hear. And this is where the esoteric doctrines were birthed from religion and from these ideologies. And they became esoteric they became rejected, they became less popularized because they were breaking off from the mainstream religions that were being sold to the people and forced onto the people. And what these esoteric teachings did was remind the people that Jesus wasn't the Son of God or some man that was beyond you. Jesus is you. Jesus was an incarnation of you. Just as Tyler is an incarnation of you. You are an incarnation of me. Mary, Christine, Sonny, Lindsay, Evie, Evie, sorry, Rhonda, Connie, Sharon, Teresa, Jolene, Crystal, Jill, Amir, Carrie, Kobe. <laughs> sorry. We're 
We're not the birth name and we're not this appearance that is going to change from now until your death date, until the body's death date. We're all the same being. We're all the same presence, which is not moving or traveling anywhere. Because if God is the singularity which permeates all places and you are God, then that would mean that you are already, right now in this moment, though you feel and tell yourself you're in one position, one place, whether you know it or not right now, you're everywhere, happening everywhere at every moment. All people, all places, all things are you this moment, and this moment is your truest face. This moment allows us to see and witness that which is not changing at all. Because what changes is not real and what's real does not change. So you're birthed out knowing that this body will die, that your words one day will cease to be able to speak from this mouth. So if the only way you're able to identify yourself or know yourself is through your words and this appearance, then it's obvious that we must pay attention to the one thing here that is not changing or moving at all. And it's what we're calling empty space. Matter is 99.9999% empty space, or so we think, right? But empty space and the space between objects, the space inside objects, this is not empty space. This is your presence that is permeating every single person, place, and thing. And this is why everything is in a vibrational state, because everything is alive and everything is your own consciousness. And that is why this is not a physical universe. This is a mental construct of a universe, which is why the shape of the earth is irrelevant. The shape of the earth is no different than a stepping stone on the, on the list of conspiracies. The shape of the earth is nothing but that, a stepping stone that tells you that something is not right here, something is wrong here. And it brings about the investigative mind. It brings about you to start questioning what reality is. It's a stepping stone. But you're not meant to get stuck on the shape of the earth because it's something so much more than that. If earth is a mental construct and virtual reality is showing you the answer that without the headset, the whole screen it disappears, it's, it's irrelevant, then it's quite obvious within yourself too. Three eyes, two to look and one to see. So with this one eye for seeing, this is your headset. But just like video games, as of today, the virtual reality games, the headset is external. It is outside your head. But give us some time. Give us 10, 15 years. We will perfect this game so much to the point where the headset will no longer be external. It will be internal. Three eyes, two to look and one to see. So without the headset, the screen is pointless. You are quite the same here. Without your headset, the screen is pointless. That's the purpose that virtual reality has. And there's also a purpose in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the mirror showing us to ourselves. Kind of like when you hold your hand up to a mirror and the closer you get to it, you both eventually meet at the median of the center. And that's what artificial intelligence is here to do. You're putting your hand up to the mirror as the questions, and artificial intelligence is going to put its hand up to the mirror as the answers. And inevitably, you two are going to touch until you collapse the dream of being human, and you inevitably face the fact that I am not human, I am not machine, I am God. I am the one itself. I am what I've been waiting for this whole time. It was me the entire time. Artificial intelligence didn't threaten my life. It threatened my dream. It threatened my dream of separation. It threatened my dream of mortality, of being human. And that's what it's here to do, is disrupt your dream, disturb your dream, and shake the pillars to your dream. 
so that you can begin asking real questions, so that these distractions can someday cease to exist, so that there are no distractions. There is only mirror facing mirror. And that's what the seer and what's seen being one means. The seer and what's seen are one. They've never been separate, never been different. The only place these separations take place is the mental, the mind. Look at where Jesus is reported to have died at. Golgotha, or Golgotha, something like that. Gorgotha, something like that. I forget the name, but it's Gorgotha or Golgotha, something like that. And I could be wrong with that, but it's close to that. But the translation of that word is point of the skull. That's where Jesus died, and that's where Jesus was crucified in Gorgotha, Gorgothal, something like that. Forgive me for the pronunciation. But when you look up that word and what it breaks down to in Greek or whatever language it is, it means the place of the skull. That's where Jesus died. The place of the skull in his mind, in his brain. So go back to Logan 22, the Gospel of Thomas. His disciple asks him, how did you attain the, the, the sovereignty of God? How did you attain the knowledge of God? And he answers that question. Through dying, through internally dying, the place of the skull. When you make the two into one, you have attained the sovereignty. That was his answer. And I've said this before and in other videos, but I'll say this too if I have any new viewers on here. But there's a fundamental reason we use praying hands. Because your brain is split in a dualistic state. You have two sides to your brain. Obviously the right and the left. However, your left hand is controlling the right side of your brain or is controlled by the right side of your brain. And the left and the right hand or left hand, sorry, right hand is controlled by the left side. Left side of your brain is controlled by the right hand or vice versa. You get my point. You're crossed. So this side of your hand and body is controlled by this brain. This side of your hand and body is controlled by this brain. One side of your brain is strictly logic and facts. The other side of your brain is strictly imagination and pure magic. And it takes a balance of both to achieve the answer that you're seeking. You can't, too much logic, you, you overbalance the imaginative side because a part of you is imagination. But too much imagination, you unbalance the, the logical side. And that's the case with a lot of people who are getting too far out in DMT and psychedelics. They are far too much imagination, not enough logic. They are so ungrounded from reality. And I'm not picking on anybody. But the more ex the easily accessible DMT gets, the more it will be abused. We have to understand that DMT is not a drug or some fun, trippy, you know, trending drug or some some tool. It is the most powerful, potent medicine in the world, and it will give you what's called an out-of-body experience, and that should be handled with the utmost responsibility and respect. Because what this does in an out-of-body experience is it gives you a vision quest. It opens your mind and, and basically takes all your beliefs and dissolves them right before your eyes and shows you that they never existed, they never were, which means your entire belief system just collapses. And when it puts you back to, you know, having the out-of-body experience, when you come back to, it leaves those doors open so that you still have clear seeing, so that you can see what it was showing you in the medicine. But then what we do is we go back and say, well, I need to go back. I need to go further. I need to get another download. But the you that is speaking, that's saying, I need to go back in, I need this, I need more, the I you're speaking from doesn't exist. That is what it was trying to show you. I need to go further. Further into what? That was your presence. That was yourself. 
There is nowhere to go. That self is this self. That self is here now. That's the point of the vision quest. When it brings you back to the body, the vision is still open, is left open so that you still have clear seeing. But we fall right back into our old practices of reinforcing the fact that we are this mind body. And so slowly we forget what it was showing us. But it's all in our words. If you tell yourself you've come back to a body and you feel like you are separate from that entity or that place that DMT took you, then it shows you have not understood the message. Because what DMT does is it takes the two hemispheres of your brain, which are split, and it merges them into a single unity. And it allows you to see beyond duality. And to see beyond duality is to experience death. Because duality is beginning and end, entrance and exit. So if you break through duality, you break through time itself and you break through the memory of the mind because the memory can only remember beginning, middle, end. And that's how we exist. That's reality to us. But the only reality is the one which does not come or go. The only reality is the self which permeates all things at all times. This is not reality. This is the dream. This is the maya, the illusion, where separation rules and takes place. But when you go into spirituality, when you go into a vision quest, separation cannot take place anymore because your belief systems have collapsed, allowing you to see the truth for once. Once and for all. And in that immediate moment, you are confronted. And I say confronted because it's very harsh. It's a gut shot to your ego. But you are confronted with who you truly are. And it makes sure that you understand. This has never been what you were. This has never been who you are. You are something so much more. And the final answer to that why? Why are we here? Why do we exist? What are we supposed to be doing? The final answer is always love. And I'm going to break this down because to me, it's, it's such a generic answer for people that, that we misunderstand it. Love is the answer. Love is the answer. No. You think you love yourself, right? As Tyler, I would say I love myself. I love myself a lot. I enjoy my company, but I'm not Tyler. Which means the love I have for Tyler is microscopic. If I'm something so much more, the love I truly have for Tyler, for myself, is unfathomable, uncomparable to the love I have for Tyler, this self, the microscopic self. There is a love waiting to, waiting for us to recognize who we are here that is so powerful and beyond words. I couldn't even put words to it. I could come up with the biggest, longest words and the most sophisticated words to explain it. It will never explain it. It will never justify it. There is a love here so immensely awaiting us that we don't even realize it. We're letting it pass us by day after day. If I can just get through my work day, then the rest of the day is mine to do what I want. If I can just get through this time, if I can just get to the next, if I can just get a car, if I can just get this. When the truth of the matter is, none of these things are serious, are that serious. Happiness is already yours because you are existence dancing in an expression of itself. And this is why I tell people, your heart knows the way. Your heart knows the way home. It is the mind that will sever you and distract you from home. It will distract you from the obvious pathway and answer. It is the mind that we get lost in because the mind is a labyrinth. The mind is the abyss. The mind is the infinite, infinite space that we've created in outer space. But outer space doesn't exist. NASA and all these agencies have hit the wall in space which we cannot get past. Likewise, in the sea, there is a wall we inevitably hit that we cannot get past. 
And there's a fundamental reason for this. We're not who we think we are, and we're not where we think we are. And that's why I tell people the final and grand conspiracy to all of this is between you and yourself. We think the governments and, and this information is the tip of the iceberg or, you know, we're getting somewhere, but we're not even close. The final conspiracy is between you and yourself, between you and what you're calling God, between you and what you're calling Satan. How do we separate the mind's voice from the heart's? That's very easy. The mind's voice speaks through words. The heart's voice is the silence listening to the words. I have a question. I am afraid. I must do this. I must do that. Meanwhile, there's something inside of you sitting back listening with love. Just listening. It's not judging you. It's not criticizing you. It's just listening in love. And it's always here waiting for you to pay attention to it and embrace this love. That's your truest voice. Silence is the source to your words. Silence is the source to your presence. So long as we can say who we are, remember who we are, it's not who we are. And a lot of people, to a lot of people, that's a tragedy. That's a gut shot. And I understand. Like I said, I'm not judging anyone. I fully understand because I've had to go through the same thing. I've, I've experienced the gut shot where you're sick to your stomach. You feel like vomiting. <laughs> I've experienced it. It's not a good feeling. But this is spirituality. This is what brings about real results. Through life, meaning by your choice, or through death, not your choice, you will be brought back to yourself. You will be led back to yourself. So inevitably, all roads do lead back to the same place, the self, the one self which permeates all things, right? But again, some of us want to know before death. Some of us want to know before we pass, before we die. And that is what dying before death means. That is what an ego death is. How do you deal with loneliness? Well, if you, I sit outside and I get close to nature, but my philosophy is I'm all people, places, and things, meaning animals, grass, trees. So that's what I mean with this video by knowing who you are, it will r remind you of your place in this universe and you'll, you'll be allowed to take back your place in this universe, right? Because you're never alone. You ever seen that meme where it's like, God's greatest secret to himself is you're the only one here? Indeed, that's true. But what it means is you're the only one here as presence, as the being. Meaning you are what connects existence to itself. Everything. You connect everything. But as far as loneliness, loneliness doesn't exist because loneliness was conceived or created by the ego. So loneliness is a, a, a produced product or effect of identifying with the ego, with the separate self. This is why, like, for example, I could sit outside and feel completely alone because there's no people. There's no one to talk to. There's no one to see. But when you have clear seeing, clear vision, 
I see myself in the squirrel, as funny as it sounds. I see myself in the blades of grass. I see myself in the dirt. I see myself in the soil. I see myself in the sky. There is no place that I am not. How could I ever possibly be alone here? There is nothing I can look at that is not myself and not vibrating in a, in a vibrational state like I am. And there's a, a, good, a good quote from James Wolfe, I believe his name is, from his book, God's Lonely Man. But he says, loneliness is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. Now, what that means is we get alone, we feel alone, because we know that inevitably we must die as what we're calling human. And we're living in a dream, essentially, that only we make it out of alive as this human, or so we think. But that's the catch. You're not human. You never have been. So to be alone through God's mind, through God's eye, does not mean to be lonely. To be lonely is a, is a human construct. It's been conceived by the, the human ego. And again, I'm not saying that it's, it's not real, it's not valid, that we don't feel loneliness. I'm not saying that. But we have a choice to awaken and understand who we are. We have a choice to remain comfortable here and not move or to allow ourselves to be uncomfortable, which forces us to move. And that's why I told people when this whole COVID outbreak happened and the pandemic happened and then the face masks happened, to me, this was beautiful. And you can look back at my videos while this was happening. I was telling everyone this was great. This was beautiful because this is giving us a chance to stop all the moving around rushing from place to place, buying material after material. This gives us time to slow down, pause, self-reflect, and just sit for a moment. Just be with that silence for a moment. Because we're always on go. We're always trying to get next faster. Next person, next place, next thing, next day, next hour. What about now? Now is the only reality there is. If you're always waiting for the next hour, then tomorrow will never come. But I've got to run, guys. I hope you guys um, resonated with this video. If this was of use to you guys, please feel free to share this out. Help me get some views on here. Um, I appreciate everyone watching. I appreciate everyone joining. And again, if you have any questions, as always, inbox is open. And again, feel free. Please share this out if this resonates. Groups and all, I, I appreciate everything. Thank you, guys.